Okay, so this is my screen. And this Perfect. is my show. And uh, are we on then? You're on. So take it away, uh, Mary Lou. Okay, my name is Mary Lou Van Deventer, but uh, really I'm anti entropy. So I want to talk just for a couple of minutes. Uh, other people will be doing uh, real presentation, longer presentations. I just wanted to say the underpinning, everybody knows reduce, reuse, recycle are the fundamental three laws of recycling, three rules. And uh, people have lots and lots of other R's. There's reduce, there's repair, there's um, repurpose. There's a, it, some people have like 15 or 20 R's. But I just want to talk about the original three R's and how come they are the three R's because uh, it's entropy. It's the second law of thermodynamics and it really rules recycling and it dictates the hierarchy of recycling and why there is a hierarchy. The thing about the second law of thermodynamics is that it says uh, that natural processes are irreversible. When Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall, he cannot be put back together again. And time flies like a now, Groucho Marx said, okay, time flies like an arrow. It's one direction, Groucho Marx said. Uh, fruit flies like bananas, but we just want to talk about the time flying like an arrow. It goes in one direction. And as Bob Dylan said, lost time is not found again. And this, this law, second law of thermodynamics is never going to be, uh, Einstein said it will never be overturned. It applies to the material resources we bring out of the earth and the energy we use in mining or cutting trees or making products, when we use energy, it becomes less organized after it's been used once. So when we make things, energy is released. When we recycle things, energy is released. When we build things, energy is released. And every time matter changes its state, its entropy increases. And we can think of entropy as disorder or chaos. And when we uh, collect materials for recycling and we process them, the disorder overall will increase because that's how the natural world works. That's how the universe works. So if we have a manufactured object and we change its state, its molecules are going to be more disorderly than they were. And the process is irreversible. We can, we can reconstruct something, at, but only by adding more energy from the outside. So it, unless we add energy from the outside, the, the disorder is automatically, automatically increased, which means that the discard management system has to recover in order to minimize the need for added energy, if we want to conserve both materials and energy, the way recycling has its goal, we need to set up a discard management system that recovers materials, not energy, and we need to minimize the state changes. So if you have a wooden table, um, I can sell it. I, I can recover that discarded wooden table. One person doesn't want it anymore for whatever their reason is. So we bring it into urban ore and we sell it as is as a wooden table. And this is the way to conserve both the material and the energy that went into its um, harvesting and manufacturing and production. Um, and we also conserve cultural value, but in terms of physical energy, uh, we conserve as much as can be conserved. But if the table is damaged and it can no longer be used as is, and it needs to be chopped up for recycling, it can be chopped up for recycling, but then you can't reassemble it. It's Humpty Dumpty. It can't be put back together again. So order, the molecules order has been disrupted. They will never be as orderly as they are looking at that table now. So it, uh, to conserve both energy and materials, you, you minimize the number of state changes. So here's at the top, we have the, uh, this is a 19, this is interesting. It, the uh, Packer truck was invented by a company, developed by a company in Detroit in 1937, 1938. This is an ad from 1938 showing the insides of the Packer truck. And it is designed to maximize chaos, to mash everything together and, and compact it 
in order to uh, give your uh, uh, operators a longer route, um, but it's not designed to conserve the materials or the energy in the materials at all. Below that, we see uh, a, pa uh, a truck that doesn't use, I don't know if it uses compaction. Ruth, do you know that this, this is a dual stream collection truck on the left? is one set of materials and on the right is another set of materials and the dual streams are uh, collecting separated materials so as not to mix incompatible materials. So if you want to conserve the materials as much as possible, you'll collect in dual stream. Um, so that's what uh, determines the resource hierarchy, the conservation hierarchy. First, you reduce the use of resources in the first place in your production. And secondly, if, if you know, when materials are used and discarded, because they will be, then you can conserve the most materials and energy if you use them. But if that cannot happen anymore, then you recycle them in order to recover the base materials. You lose both the cultural value and the manufacturing's embodied energy that way. But that's why the hierarchy is the way it is. It's the second law of thermodynamics because time flies like an arrow. Right? Uh, natural processes are irreversible. So that's the thing. The thing to do is slow down entropy. And you can dispose of things by recycling or you can dispose of them by landfilling or incineration, which is disorderly. So uh, what our field of enterprise is, is uh, slowing down entropy. And thank you very much. And now we have another person who's going to take over and uh, give a very fine presentation if I can. Kelly, you can go ahead and start sharing your speaker screen. Speaker order again. So we have Kelly who is going to. Uh, See my slides? Looks good. So Kelly is going to talk about uh, food and food reuse and what what can and cannot be done. Uh, well, food that's reuse or food container about. reuse. Okay. <laughs> food container reuse. Okay. Thank you very much, Kelly. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Kelly Bennings, and my pronouns are she and her. For those that are unable to see me today, I'm a petite, could also say short, white middle-aged woman with short brown hair standing in my office. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm on stolen Tamuqua, Muskegee land, where many individuals have faced displacement and suffering and hope one day they receive restorative measures. Um, on the screen here, I want to acknowledge that this presentation was actually created by Anthony Lamondo, who is a great PhD candidate that we have doing this research with us. Um, so shout out to Anthony. So first, uh, a quick introduction about the center. We are a national nonprofit conservation organization that works through a combination of science, the law, activism, and creative media to protect wildlife and the wild places they need to thrive. On the screen, you're seeing all of our different programs. All right, whoops. So our goal with this research is to answer various questions regarding the regulatory ability to use reusable containers in food service at the federal and state levels, and then advocate for change where needed. I'm sure you've all had this experience. You go into a restaurant, you ask them to put food in a reusable container that you brought from home, and you're told that the food code doesn't allow it. This is just one example we're looking to validate. As you'll soon hear, each state handles this differently. So we wanna create a national database that lists the differences between state food codes. We do not plan to review local government variances at this point, and we're also focused mostly on restaurants, but we could expand this to food trucks, grocery stores, and bulk aisles. 
I am going to throw a lot of information at you on these slides, and I'm going to go through them quickly, but this deck is available to you afterwards. So please reach out for them if, if you want that. Okay, so let's start with the federal food code. While you have the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, policy imp implementation is often handled at the departmental bureaucracy level. So the food code related items are coordinated through the executive branches department of agriculture, the department of commerce and the department of health and human services, which you're seeing here kind of highlighted in the middle of the screen. So the FDA within the department of health and human services works to protect the public's health and ensures the safety of the nation's food supply which is highlighted in white on the screen. Um, so lots of bureaucracy here. So then to dive deeper into the FDA and the federal food code, it is not a law nor a regulation. It is a model that represents advice. And while it is designed to be consistent with federal law, it makes no legal mandates. Its goal is to prevent contamination and the outbreak of disease. So, I just went over the left-hand side of this slide on the previous slide. So now let's go over the right-hand side. So this advice in the food codes is adopted, it's adopted by the states. So this may require changes to the food code via state legislature, through departmental rulemaking, or they may even delegate it to local governments to allow for variances. Okay, keep with me here. So to complicate this, <laughs> the FDA federal food code is updated every four years or so. But just because a new federal food code comes out, it does not mean the states adopt it. So this map shows the variety in states using various versions of the federal food code. So you can see South Dakota is still on the 1995 version. But 18 states are on the most recent 2017 version. Now, if you do the math, if the last version was in 2017 and it gets updated every four years, we were due for a new version in 2021. But that is um, delayed due to COVID. Okay. Adding another layer on top of this, <laughs> So states can adopt the federal food code verbatim, which is called short form, or they can adopt bits and pieces of the food code, which is called long form. So each state is on a different year and each state may be doing long or short form. Okay, so here are the research questions we were trying to answer. Can I bring, can I refill my own drink container? Can I refill my own food container? Can a restaurant refill a container? Can a third party organization refill a container? And does it matter who does the refilling? Is it the consumer or the restaurant? So these were our research questions. So what Anthony has done for us is he looked at all the different food codes, 2001 to 2017, for parts of the code that pertain to reuse. So imagine there's 600 pages, right? Shown on the screen are the key terms he was looking for. And I'll briefly talk about how some of them relate to this work. I don't have time to go into all of them. And from here on out, I'm going to be mostly referring to the 2017 and 2013 versions of the Federal Food Code, which would equal 34 states. So this applies to 34 states. Okay, lots of text on this slide. Again, I will share these, these notes with you. But the left hot side of the screen is essentially saying, um, it's talking about reuse within a restaurant, right? So for example, when you go to a buffet line, they always ask you to get a new plate. The right-hand side of the screen talks specifically about restaurant provided to-go containers. 
So if the container is made for reuse, and there's a whole thing about what that means, and if it is returned to the restaurant for cleaning before refilling, this would be allowed. But it specifically says single service articles cannot be reused. So a plastic fork that you would think of as single use couldn't be reused. A metal fork could be. This side of the screen also dives deep into consumer owned beverage containers. So in most instances, this is allowed. An example here would be, um, you know, you have a, a reusable coffee cup and you take it to the nearest convenience store, you know, to have the coffee come into your cup from kind of a drip type coffee situation. Okay. This slide brings in the idea of a food processing plant. So our end goal would be to have reuse be commonplace. Not everyone is gonna to wanna to carry around their own refillable cups, cutlery, and to-go containers. So what would it look like if we had an infrastructure that facilitated this through third-party sanitizing organizations or what the federal food code considers a food processing plant? Well, they must provide containers that are durable and made for reuse. It must be properly cleaned, sanitized, and visually inspected. They must use hot water that is under pressure and not recirculated. And the transfer of the container to the consumer must be contamination free. So you can see that there's a number of technical terms here that must be met, but in theory, this is doable. Unfortunately, this language is only in the 2013 and 2017 versions of the Federal Food Code. So if a state is on an older version, this would not be allowed. So where is all this research headed? So what we're planning to do um, is early next year, the center will be creating a free searchable database that shows all the different state food codes in relation to reuse. Each state will have a snapshot like this that's showing on the screen for Washington. So beyond creating the database, we plan to work in coalition to create some model language that states can adopt because you would need to update your code. So for example, Washington would be a great model. They expanded the definition of a thermos, legally allowing additional containers for beverage refilling. They codified the ability to use personal containers in the bulk aisle if it is gravity fed, meaning you kind of pull down. They added a statement that says, a consumer can ask an employee to refill a visually clean container owned by the consumer that um, goes through a, um, using a contamination free process. This doesn't mean the employee has to do what the consumer requested, but it allows for a variance to be given for those establishments that do want to use reuse. So while this does not open the floodgates, it is definitely an entry point and still much needs to be agreed upon as to what a contamination free process looks like, but this is a start. And we have maybe a, almost a handful of states that we could pull from for this um, model code. Okay, again, crazy slide. I love Anthony and his slides. So in conclusion, at the national level, we are looking at, oh yeah, at the national level, we're looking at those states with a short form 2013 or 2017 federal food code. Is reuse permissive? Well, from this flow chart, it matters if you're refilling the beverage container or if you're re refilling a food container. It matters if your container um, was provided to you or if you provided the container. And it matters if you're the one filling the container or if the restaurant is filling the container. So that, that is what Anthony is trying to describe on this slide. So here um, are our research questions answered. But as you can see, there are a lot of asterisks. So, a consumer can refill their own beverage container, but they cannot use their own container for food refills. A consumer can put their leftover food in their own to-go container that they brought themselves. So it's already been served to you and it's like your doggy bag. An establishment can refill a beverage or food container that they provide to you. Now, a lot of businesses are not, restaurants are not in the business of 
um, providing to go containers that you bring back to them. And establishments can use third party cleaning services for food containers that they provide to consumers as long as that third party service uh, follows all the rules in the code. I hope this is clear as mud. I am out of time. <laughs> Um, so, if you want to get involved in this work, I'm facilitating a monthly call through Upstream's reuse forum. I'll put my info in the chat. Please reach out if you want an invite. Um, please reach out if you want the slides. There's going to be a large um, meeting in 2023 about updating the federal food code. We would love to have you involved in that. So, I will stop sharing my screen uh, and thank you. Oh, Kelly, what a wonderful presentation. I'm totally confused. I, I have no idea how you can keep track of all this. I will look forward to printing it out. Now we have a hand raised over here. Josh, are you raising your hand? No? Okay. Uh, so next, um, and we'll, we'll go through the presentations and then we'll have uh, the, the Q and A. So next we have Daniela Men Menendez and uh, Daniela began, she, she does uh, consulting on zero waste and environmental policy. She began her work in zero waste at the San Francisco Department of the Environment, S SFE. And I just wanna say if anybody aspires to be a bureaucrat, that is the place to go uh, to be your cutting edge bureaucracy and your cutting edge bureaucrat. It's a wonderful thing. So Danielle, uh, would you please, help us and tell us how to race to zero waste. Absolutely, it looks like, okay, here we go. So hi everyone, um, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to share with you all the work that we're doing at Race to Zero Waste. Um, my name is Daniela Menendez, as mentioned, and I am the Outreach Coordinator with Race to Zero Waste. So I wanna start by giving a uh, brief background as to who we are and what we do. Race to Zero Waste is a woman-founded and run 501c3 environmental nonprofit dedicated to reducing consumption of single-use plastics, implementing reuse, reducing waste, and promoting an equitable circular economy. And at Race to Zero Waste, we are mission-driven, and our aim is to support communities, businesses, and governments in the training, education, and policy work needed to move toward a just and equitable circular economy. In support of our mission, uh, Race to Zero Waste works to build local, national, and global campaigns through a network of community coalition leaders. Our projects are funded primarily from grants and volunteer and fee for service programs, some of them which some of you may know. Um, I feel like our most notable one is our Zero Waste pop-up of, uh, pop events through our Love Your Neighborhood campaign. Uh, this campaign facilitates community cleanups, waste characterization studies, and zero waste education on reuse, composting, and recycling. We also provide a collection point for gently used items that can be donated to those in need. And then one thing that I think is really neat about this uh, campaign that we do, we also focus on hiring formerly, formerly incarcerated people to help manage on-site operations. So we provide green job training and assist them in being reintroduced into society, which is great. Um, so this is one of our zero waste pop-up stations at Dolores Park for our Love Dolores campaign, um, partnering with Rec and Park in the city. We also have zero waste month through the month of October. If you didn't catch us this year, you can catch us next year. So, and you can also see our live streams, uh, they're on YouTube. So let me know if you wanna see them. But this is an annual campaign that we put on and throughout, uh, throughout the month of October, like I said, we share educational content and starter tips. We dive a little deeper with expert interviews and we ask participants to share their experiences and get involved in the community. And then outreach and technical assistance. So we provide waste audits, site visits, webinars, and trainings. We work with local leaders on zero waste activities at events, residential properties, schools, and commercial businesses uh, to help reduce waste and then highlight best practices to avoid single-use disposables. And our goal at Race to Zero Waste um, is to build a global network of diverse, sustainable leaders who can provide effective zero waste solutions 
to their communities by developing local grassroots coalitions to solve some of the most pressing environmental challenges. Which leads me uh, to our most recent project, uh, implementing reusables for on-site and takeaway food serviceware on university campuses. So this past year, Race to Zero Waste applied for and received a grant through the Altamont Education Advisory Board. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and to assist us in implementing reusables within Alameda County. And our focus area is in Southern Alameda County in Fremont and Hayward. We chose these two cities because we noticed that there has been a lot of attention more in the Northern part of the county, Oakland, Berkeley, which is great. Um, but we wanted to share the wealth of resources and provide an equitable approach to the project. In support of Alameda County zero waste goals, we propose a training partnership and assistance project beginning with university and community college restaurants, cafes, and university groups to increase the uptake of reusables and durable food serviceware. And our goal is to establish a network and ecosystem of informed university stakeholder groups on the benefits of reusables and costs associated with implementing them on site. The two schools that we are focusing on for this year are Ohlone Community College in Fremont and Cal State East Bay in Hayward. And Ohlone, after speaking with, speaking with them, actually recently upgraded their whole, their entire dining hall. They completely redid it. And they have dishwashing on site, which is really great news. They use uh, currently are using compostable and plastic single use products for all of their dining in and takeaway material. And they're only at partial capacity uh, for students due to COVID. Um, they have some plans of potentially having everyone come back, but right now they're still remaining at partial capacity. So that's about 5,000 students on campus a day with roughly, with roughly 150 to 200 transactions per day for dine-in and takeaway. And the school has been hesitant. Um, the faculty has been hesitant and have some fears about reusables not being cost effective due to not having full student capacity. Um, but we have expressed that this is a perfect time to pilot a new program and to iron out any hurdles or barriers before a complete implementation with a full student population. Now, Cal State East Bay has durable containers for takeaway in their dining halls already, which is great. Um, they rent the, the containers to students per semester and it's tagged with their ID card. There's a little barcode underneath each container and that's how they keep track of them. However, Cal State East Bay being a larger school have third party restaurants, cafes, and food vendors on campus. And so our focus is to work with one or two restaurants with the assistance of the student coalition group to transition them to reusables for takeaway. Fortunately, uh, the two schools have dishwashing capacity on campus, so we will utilize those services and work with staff and the food vendors to create a hyper localized circular reuse economy. And additional goals to be met for this project includes the empowerment and a creation of a student-led coalition made up of community college and university student groups and faculty. So this is being achieved through a zero waste ambassador leadership training for students and faculty in zero waste principles, including promoting the acceptance of reusables and durables on campus for their dining in, takeout, and then bring your own campaigns. Our organization, Race to Zero Waste, will be providing the training, education, and outreach, and the student groups will then in turn help us in outreach and engagement with dining hall services and students on campus. They're the ones that are there every day, day in, day out, so it makes sense to sort of empower them to help us with this work. And then we also recognize the work with students will be, um, the work that the students will be assisting us with on top of their schoolwork, how much that could be. And much like our zero waste pop stations, we wanna provide green job training in an equitable manner. So we've carved out some of our grant funding to provide a student stipend. And so two of our goals for this project is to institutionalize the practice of zero waste and the use of reusables on campuses so that it continues beyond the grant. We really want this to work once our presence is no longer there. Um, we will always be made available to help them with any questions or maybe provide technical assistance to the universities. And we're hoping to garner future funding to continue the project into a following year. Our second goal, and one we are simultaneously working on, is to expand and collaborate in pushing the reuse movement to the broader community in Alameda County. 
uh, we're in the process of reaching out to local partners, city agencies, and organizations in creating a coalition group of engaged stakeholders for the entire county. We want to spread the reuse movement across the Bay Area and create the infrastructure necessary for businesses and cities to eliminate single use waste. Um, because I think upstream really says it perfectly, but reuse wins. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much again for having me. If you have questions about our programs and policies, please feel free to reach out. Um, I can be made available to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Danielle, that was terrific. That was terrific. Um, it was interesting that uh, in Kelly's slide, California, all of California was gray, which means that as usual, uh, California seems to be inventing its own rules and creating its own rules. So it would be interesting to uh, to know what the rules are in California, which I guess you know. Um, I do not. But next, next person we have here is Josh Simpson, who is uh, from Berkeley, um, my current hometown, my hometown. Uh, he grew up in Berkeley in the 70s in a house where recycling was the norm which I have to say in, in Berkeley, that's pretty much true. And he was educated in public schools. Thank you, Josh, for saying that. Uh, as a former public school teacher, I'm very pleased to hear that. And you've done all kinds of stuff, but you do spend a lot of time outdoors apparently. So now you have this little propane uh, innovation for reuse. Uh, will you help us out and describe what you do? Are you muted? You're muted. Can you unmute? Josh, I cannot hear you. There you go. That's better. There, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, some, somebody had to glitch up the show. So it's uh, today that's me. Thought I already did that, but that's okay. Oh, well, I'm just <laughs> following in your footsteps, Mary Lou. Um, so, uh, so um, my, my name is Josh Simpson, and I am the vice president and co-founder of Little Camper Propane. And what I'm going to be talking about today is a program that we created. Um, it's actually been around for about seven years now. Um, that is intended to give people who use propane for outdoor recreation an alternative to using disposable single-use uh, fuel cylinders. And um, as you can see from the picture on the left, um, unfortunately, the, the legacy of that choice um, is um, harmful to parks and campgrounds. And so I'm going to talk about why we're doing what we're doing and how it works and share the basic idea that you don't have to um, create waste in order to enjoy recreation. So um, the story of who we are um, basically the gentleman who's there on the right is the owner of the company john camps um, he's been in the propane industry for over a, a half century um, i'm the i'm the guy with the big grin on the left uh, and the gentleman standing next to me is terry Ayers. he retired recently but he was the president of the company up until a short time ago and then eric holdren's the guy on the right um, he's basically our uh, account rep working with different stores. Um, this is the group of people, really small group, but um, I would like to think that even though even though we're small and even though we're old, we're still trying to do something that we think is really um, important and, and hopefully successful in reducing waste in the um, outdoor world. So the reason why we're doing this is because um, we all worked for a company that among other things was providing a service to parks and campgrounds as a recycling destination for these single use cylinders. And unfortunately, what many people didn't realize is that there are about 40 million of these fuel cylinders used every, every year in America. Um, the sad truth of it is, is that they are inexpensive to purchase, but they are expensive, unfortunately, um, in their consequence to the race waste stream because the total cost of collecting them from the places where they're left behind and then transporting them to a place where they can be properly recycled and then recycling them the way we do, which is to actually capture the gas that is left in the cylinders for reuse before the containers are punctured to make them safe for recycling and then making sure that they are properly reused as, as scrap steel. Um, the total cost of that is higher than the cost of purchasing 
a new single use fuel cylinder. And as everybody knows, unfortunately, in the world of recycling, whenever the economics are upside down, the consequence is bad for the environment. So we knew about this because we were providing these recycling services, which put us in a position to see something when this happened. In 2013, a manufacturer by the name of Flame King introduced what was then the world's first refillable one pound propane cylinder. This cylinder is identical in size to a disposable or single use tank. However, it is designed with features that make it safe to be reused. And the beauty of this is that it creates an alternative for people who prefer that small tank um, to use a container that can be reused for up to 12 years. The beauty of it is, is that for some people, um, they want to refill this tank themselves. That's the economical way to access fuel in a disposable or a refillable cylinder. But we were, we came to this place from the propane industry and it makes us very nervous to believe that people would be refilling the cylinders themselves because that's a process that has some significant hazards to the person who's doing it, particularly if they're either unfamiliar with the process and not doing it properly, or if they're the kind of person who would choose to try and undertake the process without using the proper protective gear. So we realized that from the propane industry's perspective, that if we cared about the environment, that it might be a responsible choice for us to replicate a process that American consumers are already familiar with which is that many people who use propane for a barbecue grill that they might have on their back porch at their home, they get more gas when they're running out by taking that empty cylinder to a nearby grocery or hardware store and exchanging that empty cylinder for a full cylinder in a transaction where the empty cylinder is returned to a production center where it can be safety checked and refilled and the full canister goes home with the consumer who wants to be able to access the fuel but doesn't want to deal with the process of refilling it themselves. So we saw the market opportunity of offering an environmentally conscious alternative to the disposable cylinder and that's when we started doing the little camper business in 2014. So the basic story of this is that when you look at what happens in the retail marketplace, people walk into a sporting goods or hardware or grocery store and they buy a single use propane cylinder. The price points at this point in time could be anywhere from around $3.50 or $4 up to as much as $10, depending upon where you buy them. Many of them are used in parks and campgrounds. The picture that's on the top um, left side of the um, propane cylinder uh, recycling bin is in the Upper Pines Campground in Yosemite. The next picture over from that is unfortunately um, from the National Park Service's waste collection facility in El Portal, where all of the tanks that are collected in Yosemite are brought before they are ultimately transported down into the valley for recycling. The picture next to that, which is my pickup truck, is filled in the back with all of those disposable or single use cylinders because starting in 2020, we volunteered to conduct a waste stream, a fuel cylinder waste stream audit at Yosemite National Park, along with volunteers from the Yosemite Conservancy and people who were also volunteering through the National Park Service. We started going to El Portal, it was about five times a year where we would sort, count, and then aggregate all of the fuel cylinders that had been left in the park campgrounds for the sake of providing real data to the National Park Service and also to folks in Sacramento about what the real consequence of this um, problem product were for our parks and campgrounds. The gentleman who's on the upper right is a coworker of mine and what he's doing in that picture is he's evacuating a single use one pound propane cylinder that came out of Yosemite. The tanks are frequently disposed of with fuel still inside of them. So our process recovers that fuel, 
At that point, the tank gets punctured and it can be recycled as scrap. The total cost of that entire adventure is unfortunately the reason why so many of those tanks are never recycled and actually end up in landfills. Not as often in California, but still all over the rest of the United States and in some parts of California, those tanks are not getting recycled. They're just rusting in landfills. So on the bottom half of this page, you can see the picture where the three guys are in our automated production facility, which is in Manteca, California. That system was designed by a company in Denmark. And what we do is we have a system where we can put those tanks on a conveyor belt. The system will weigh the tank to determine if there's any fuel still inside of it, fill the tank to its proper level, give it a weight check to verify that it was properly filled, and then leak test it to verify that in fact it's safe at that point to push back out in the marketplace. Um, the picture next to that is one of the sales associates at Cole Hardware in San Francisco. They are one of our customers. They offer our product along with, uh, we have Ace Hardware stores all over California in the West. The picture on the right, you know, I use just to remind people that these tanks are compatible with all of the different devices, you can use a disposable tank. You can use one of our reusable tanks. And the picture on the far right is actually the village store in Yosemite National Park. In 2020, the park concessionaire, Aramark Hospitality, signed an agreement with us to begin offering Little Camper Propane Tank Exchange in Yosemite National Park. Yosemite National Park no longer sells single use propane cylinders. And we think that that's a smart choice for parks and campgrounds because you can't really get your hands around this problem while you're, sim while you're simultaneously contributing to it. So the system that we brought over from Denmark is containerized. Everything happens inside of that shipping container. You can see the system um, right there on the right hand side. It's um, High tech, we're really excited about it. It gives us the ability to scale up our business. We have a second one of these systems that's just coming online right now in Missouri. From that location, we'll begin offering service to the Midwest and a third container will come online in late winter that will allow us to begin offering our program to retailers across the lower 48. We want to be able to do this, oops, sorry, wrong direction um for the entire lower 48. so when we started doing this in 2021 um as a as a larger scale program we took it to um, some of the different trade shows that are important to the industries that sell single-use propane tanks um and we started being recognized with innovation awards um best in show for the outdoor retailer show and innovation award uh, a retailer's choice award from hardware retailing magazine. Um, we've been getting some valuable recognition because truthfully, I mean, unfortunately for us, this is not a product that produces a lot of income for us as a company. Um, we have to basically um, share the revenue of this company with the delivery service. We use FedEx ground that takes it out to our stores and brings empty tanks back to us. And with the retailers who are selling the product, it is more expensive than a disposable tank, but the environmental consequences of reuse of this cylinder is good for our parks and campgrounds. And every single time one of our customers reuses one of our tanks, it's one less tank in the waste stream, which we think is absolutely worth the higher cost. So, whoops, I keep going backwards. I'll learn better. Um, now, um, what you can see is that um, what started in Yosemite in 2020, we are now, our program is now available in the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park at Crater Lake and Grand Teton National Park. Um, we are working with some of the state of California's parks and we are looking forward to expanding the program further next year. Um, the exciting thing is, is that we're getting really encouraging signs from the marketplace. If you look at all those little tanks, those mark 
locations where we have retail oper you know, retail stores in the Western United States. Um, we have really exciting news to share today. Actually, I'm I'm submitting the paperwork today. Um, we're going from 10 Western states in 2022 to all of the lower 48 in 2023. And in 2023, by late March or early April, will not only be available in Ace Hardware stores all over the United States, um, but we're also going to be working with REI. We're starting the map that you see right there is of the uh, 16 REI locations that we're gonna do a pilot with um, is starting in March of 2023. But REI is really interested and excited about what we're doing. And I expect that we will grow this program from those 16 stores to eventually work with all of REI's retail locations across the United States. So, you know, in closing, what I just wanna tell you is that this program lives and breathes based upon the commitment of everyone who's involved in the recreation space, whether you're an end user and you use propane as a fuel for your camping trips, or whether you're a store owner and you have the decision-making authority to bring a program like ours into your store, or whether you're a stakeholder group like the Yosemite Conservancy or um, many of the other groups that we've worked with who are collaborating to try and reduce waste around California and, and the United States, everyone plays a positive role in the expansion of our program. And we are sincerely hopeful that eventually this becomes the way that people use fuel for outdoor recreation, because there's simply no reason for single use fuel cylinders to be left behind in the places that we all wanna protect as part of the future legacy of outdoor recreation in the United States. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And thank you very much for coming to this conference and participating in this breakout session. Oh, Josh, this is just wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so this is just great. Daniela, did you have a, a comment or a question? No, no, solely just showing support by clapping. Thank you. Oh, Excited, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful program. Uh, this is great. Well, thank you very much. Now, uh, our last speaker is supposed to have been Max Wexler, but uh, he had a family emergency back east, and so he will not be with us. Um, let's see if I can get his... I have his slides or his his uh, presentation. Let's see if I can figure out how to share it. Here we are. Can everyone see this? Not yet, Mary Lou. Not yet. Do you okay. share? I think it's coming. Oh, there we are. Uh, coming, no, coming. now it's not the slides. Coming. It's just the. Uh... No, it's. Uh... Here we are. Can you that's see it. that? That's it. Yeah, it okay. looks like COVID bingo. It's COVID. It, well, it's uh, something like that. Um, so uh, Max Wexler is Urbanor's operations manager. So I'm going to be showing his slides more quickly than he might uh, because we don't have all that many minutes left. But. Urban R is, uh, this is, uh, actually, this is an interesting image. It's a painting that somebody did, <laughs> and we bought it from him after he showed it to us. He showed it to Max, and Max just fell in love with it, so Max bought it, and it's hanging up in the uh, general store. Um, Urban R is a reuse operation, and we grew starting in 1980, well, I think that's a 1981, uh, number that you have down on the left, and that was our growth through the years. We stopped doing this graph in 2011 or 12, but we have continued to grow. And um, by 2019, we had gone from nothing in 1981 to $2,582,000 for a $7,100 daily average. But then in 2020, um, it hit the fan. 
And here's uh, San Francisco uh, lockdown order, <laughs> shelter in place, they called it. Um, Berkeley just basically called it a lockdown. But, uh, and you can see what, what that did for our income in 2020, um, March. <laughs> we had to, we closed, Urban R closed for three days in March, uh, starting on the 17th. And then we reopened, and I'll tell you about that. Uh, that is the miracle um, that we were able to survive through COVID actually. So we shut down in three day, for three days, but you can see what happened to our income in March. It went down 31% year over year. And in April, it went down 39% year over year. And then we got a PPP loan of 300 and I think $30,000. And so um, we were able to stay open um, because we could pay people's paychecks um, for the people who came back. <clears throat> we had had 42 employees full-time and part-time and 18 came back um, because they stayed at home and they were afraid. And I don't blame them. Uh, I continued to go to work, but um, that's, it's my company. So I had to do that. But, uh, and other people came and 18 of us ran it, and, which turned out to be plenty of people because the customers also didn't come in. Nobody was going out. The traffic was wonderful. And the income just, we crashed. We really crashed in March and April. And in May, we started coming back up. And in June, we were only 4% down. In July, we were 0% down. But you can see what happened by December. Overall, we were 7% over the previous year. Because, yeah, and, and in 2021, then we came up a million dollars. Uh, for a 9820 dollars uh, a day average. And in 2022, we're at $10,000 a day. And the reason is that our cooperation closed. Habitat closed, Goodwill closed, Salvation Army closed. Yeah. All these, all these uh, St. Vincent closed and these uh, cooperative uh, competition um, reuse operations, they closed down, but we are an essential business. And there are three factors um, that make us essential and different from the other from the other operations in the reuse industry. We, first of all, we are a disposal option. We salvage at the dump. And when people bring things to us, they bring them to us in preference to wasting them. So we are a waste prevention and disposal company, reuse, uh, disposal through reuse, it's totally viable uh, to be a disposal company. We're in the disposal industry. People want to get rid of stuff. They want to dispose of stuff. They bring it to us. We sell it for reuse and reuse is disposal that way. So we're in the disposal business and we sold hard, we sell hardware to craft people who were doing home repairs. And we sell uh, building materials to people who are doing home repairs. And those three factors, you only need one to be considered an essential business, but we had three. So after three days of being closed, we reopened as an essential business. And boy, we were um, stiff about, you better keep your face mask on. Um, but it sure created financial hardship. We were very uh, grateful, very grateful for the stimulus money. Uh, and during COVID, we were able to stay open and maintain our enterprise because people were moving, people were were uh, turning closets into offices, and uh, businesses were closing. We, uh, it's it's part of our uh, business model that when people go out of business, they bring things to us, and we sell their goods to other people who want to go into business. So. Uh, you know, people were cleaning out their basements and, and some people died and they bring things to us. It's part of the um, truth of our function that uh, we are, um, we're, we're an option for where people can bring things when they don't have, when they've experienced uh, a catastrophe in their own lives and they need a place to take things, they can bring them to us and we're there and we help them too. Um, and then people were buying things. People had lots of home improvement projects. They were home and they wanted to remodel that closet. They had new hobbies. They were 
they wanted to go thrifting. People, anybody in the reuse enterprise uh, industry knows that people love to go thrifting. Wall Street doesn't profile us because we don't have stock that shows up on Wall Street, but everybody in the country knows that the secondhand industry is huge and mom and pop's thrift shop is you know, a place to go for fun. And people also didn't have as much else to do. Um, there were a lot of uh, people who quit their other jobs. Um, now these, these people, these are our staff and these are actually pre-COVID staff because I can see two people we lost during COVID. They just didn't, they didn't wanna come back. Uh, and I don't blame them, but um, you know, we kept going anyway. So this is uh, um, other people lost their jobs. They switched jobs. They quit here and went to work over there, and they didn't like that. But we didn't have nearly as much shuffling as some other industries did. Uh, we did change our business so that we went from two shifts down to one. We decreased our hours of operation, which uh, was very good for our staffing because our staff didn't have to spread themselves so thin. We increased our security. We did a lot of social media postings and it gave us a chance to improve our systems, our operating systems, and we grew. And people now are making more uh, within the company. We got a new roof and a huge solar system. The, the PPP loan uh, allowed us enough money uh, and, and the increase in sales allowed us enough money that we invested in the solar system. And just a shout out for solar energy, boy, our uh, electrical bill went from $2,800 a month to $28, $28 a month. We got a couple of new trucks. I got to uh, turn over my administrative manager job to somebody else who, uh, uh, Nick Raymond, who is doing a better job. Uh, but we lost our bookkeeper who didn't want to touch our stuff that was coming in. So we got a new bookkeeper and we have a new bookkeeper now. And we renewed our salvage contract and we get now a service fee, service fee of uh, $47.74 a ton, which is exactly what the landfill is paid. So when we salvage things from the transfer station floor, we get paid for that, which is right. It's a right thing to do to pay us for that work. It's better than paying the dump and the same cost. And uh, the EPA has done a study on us uh, for, oops, sorry, zero waste study. Uh, transforming waste tool, zero waste case study. And there's a webinar about our contract, which everybody in the reuse industry should know about. You can get paid by municipalities to do that, or you should be able to get paid. And we have a, a contract with the city of Berkeley for salvaging. So it was a wonderful thing. Pigs do fly. I will never sell this pig. Um, the people who made it filmed themselves making it. They filmed themselves in, uh, a parade and then they filmed themselves bringing it to us so that's our pig uh, thank you very much and that's max's uh show and thank you very much and uh, mary lou we're um we're i all think done that's the end of time, time isn't it? yeah but, it's the uh, end of we time. have a break until 2 15 so if there were any um you know any anybody dying to ask a question they could probably do a couple of questions uh because we're on break until 2 15. so anybody have any questions for anybody questions questions i don't see any hands. looks like you answered all the questions oh my gosh that never happens <laughs> well it's pretty awesome thank you guys so much Thanks to everybody on this panel. This is just a wonderful thing. Um, and uh, I'm going to be, I have downloaded all these presentations and I'm just going to be uh, combing through them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, Josh, have you considered selling in refill stores? This is a we, question from Gary Liss. Yes, and, and we can actually sell through any independent business. So anybody who wants to um, refer a, a refill store to us, there's a there's a page on our website for uh, store re, store um, excuse me referrals. So you can visit littlecamper.com. That's camper with a K, uh, littlecamper.com, and and um, that form is there for you to submit. The other thing I would tell you is that if you would please um, 
you know, jump on our social media feeds. We'd love to be able to communicate to more people through our Instagram and Facebook pages. It's a great thing for us to be able to share the information about our program. Wonderful. Okay, uh, Ruth, will, will the, uh, the questions and answers and, and all the chat, will that be available to people? Yeah, so we are able to download the chat. We'll kind of sanitize it a little bit and save it if anybody wants it. And um, the presentations will potentially, the slideshows will potentially be available. We'll talk to the speakers about their, um, what they would like to do, but we will be publishing the recordings of all the sessions. So if you've missed anything or you want to share it with somebody uh, in a couple of weeks, those will be up on our website. So thank you guys. This is, it was perfect. Exactly what we wanted. We missed Max, but we got a great substitute. So thank you guys so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. See you at 215 in the main room. <laughs>